May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing to the Lord today. When I first got word that the microphone might not be out, I thought it was a conspiracy against a Baptist preacher who had been invited here. So now I know that it is not indeed, but I am grateful to have the microphone uh, to help me. To President Williams and Dean Marshall and also to Reverend Shelton and the rest of the faculty and staff and students, I am so grateful to be here with you to worship in this beautifully refurbished chapel and as a friend and member of the bright board of visitors to have the privilege of watching and learning from you as you live out your institutional calling with true character and conviction. Moses said, would that all of the Lord's people were prophets. And I can tell you that I can think of no other seminary in the South so dedicated to what Bill Coffin called the prophethood of all believers than that of Bright Divinity School. But it's not a Southern prophet we are given today. Today we are given a Northern prophet, the prophet Jonah, son of Amittai, and the Eastern people of Nineveh, that great and iniquitous city of the Assyrian kingdom which we are told from history showed little to no mercy to those whom it conquered, but laid waste to the nations and also to their lands. Nineveh was a vile and murderous city amidst a vile and murderous empire. And Jonah was given a message to go there and to proclaim to the city its wickedness and to call it to repentance. But of course, as we all know, instead of going towards Nineveh in the east, Jonah instead went to Tarshish in the west, boarding a ship and setting sail somewhere across the sea. About as far away from Nineveh as Lubbock is from Brooklyn. <clears throat> and why is that? Why does he hop ship and run? The answer isn't really revealed until the end of the story, and it isn't the usual answer. The usual answer for the prophet's reluctance is that they're afraid. They're afraid of rejection or repudiation or even afraid they're gonna get killed. That's a pretty good reason to run. As the gutsy Baptist preacher and also civil rights leader Clarence Jordan used to say, there are times to turn the other cheek and then there are times to turn both cheeks. Think about that for a moment. But that's not the reason why Jonah runs. Jonah runs, we are told, at the end of the book, not because he thinks they won't have ears to hear, but because he thinks, well, they just might. They might just have ears to hear and eyes to see and hearts to change. And, and he might also have a God who's willing to change them. Read the story. When Jonah finally goes to Nineveh, he does everything he can to assure that the mission is a total failure. He is a model of the passive-aggressive pastor, doing everything that he can to do the least little bit he can and somehow still hold on to his job. 
Oh, you know the type. We see it in his sermon to the Ninevites in chapter 3. Jonah went a day's walk into the city and cried out, Forty days more and not Nineveh shall be overthrown. Mm. Now is it just me or is that not just about the worst sermon you've ever heard preached? No introduction, no metaphors, no illustrations. Preach that in chapel and Dean Marshall will wonder who it was that you had for homiletics. And yet, and yet, even with that lousy, half-preached sermon, the story says that all of the people of Nineveh believed the word and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth and repented. Now, lest ye get the wrong message here, I've been at this preaching business long enough to know it's usually not that easy. Usually, preaching prophetically is like crying out in the wilderness or screaming at the deaf or yelling into the wind. It simply can't be heard. As Abraham Joshua Heschel used to say, the prophet's voice is one octave too high for the human ear to hear. But sometimes, sometimes, something just happens. A new wind begins to blow, and a tiny spark takes on life and ignites a blazing fire, and the spirit moves, and with it so then do the people. It's mysterious how it happens, unexplainable and also unexpected. It's that time when, as Dr. King said, it's as if time itself gets ready to change. I've seen it happen. When I was in divinity school, we had to do something I think all divinity school students here have to do, to go and to serve in a field education placement, which I believe Reverend Shelton is in charge of for this academic year. I can tell you that those placements are almost always Nineveh kinds of assignments. Mine certainly was Lowe's Grove Baptist Church in the community of Lowe's Grove right outside of Durham, North Carolina. I was stunned when I read the stipulation the deacons from Lowe's Grove made in the request to Duke Divinity School for a student. Please don't send us a black student, the request said. We just aren't ready. I couldn't believe it. It was unacceptable. It didn't go, I didn't go to a highfalutin seminary like Duke Divinity School to be sent back out to minister to a bunch of country bumpkin racists. Here I was being sent by Duke University to exactly the kind of people I had gone to Duke University to get away from. I mean, I could have stayed right here in Texas. I would have never run out of country bumpkin racists. I wouldn't even had to leave my own family, in fact. I made my appointment with the head of field education, Reverend Shelton. I told him I didn't want to go to Lowe's Grove. I needed to go somewhere that shared my values, though of course I would settle for a chaplaincy assignment on the men's basketball team. <laughs> or better yet, 
How about just waive the requirement altogether, Reverend Shelton? I pleaded my case with the director. Did I have any options? Please, Reverend Shelton. Of course you have another option, he said. Your other option is not to graduate. I said, when do I start? And so then the church's request was honored. And they did not get a black student. But what they did get was something else I'm sure they didn't quite think that they were ready for. And that was a white student who was falling in love with a black student. I arrived at Lowe's Grove, new minister to youth and children. <laughs> Sigh. <laughs> it was re met at, by Reverend Gale at the door. Welcome to Kudzu, he said with a grin. Now, I did not know what kudzu was at the time, but later learned that it was an old cartoon by a man named Doug Marlett about a parson in a little bitty town called kudzu, and the preacher's name was Will Be Done. You're just now getting that. Will Be Done pastoring in this little town of kudzu which was said to be a place so backwards that even the Episcopalians handled snakes. <laughs> Think about that. Kudzu, Lowe's Grove, Nineveh. Now Kudzu is about the last place you would think such a student as me would ever have been sent by God. Yet here I was. And after about six months of being there and sort of testing the waters and roaring up to Reverend Gale and softening towards those people and seeing no snakes in the pews, me and my fiance to be stepped out of the car to come to church together one Easter Sunday morning. Ready or not, look who's coming for Easter. <laughs> and six months after that, after things had sort of worked themselves out, one Sunday morning, I re-walked the aisle to join the church. There was a little hurdle there still remaining. In that church, there was an old man whose name was Joe Lowe, who was at the time about mm, 140 years old. His parents had given the land where the church was built. And there was a ritual there in the church that when any, anybody walked the aisle to come and to join the congregation, Reverend Dunn, I mean Reverend Gale, would say, as they still do in a lot of little Baptist churches, do I have a motion to receive this person into fellowship? The ritual was in that little church that everyone, out of deference to the seniority of Joe Lowe, would always wait on him to make the motion. He sat right there at the front. And Sunday by Sunday, when people joined the church, which they seldom did, but when it happened, everyone would wait on, Reverend, uh, on, on, uh, on Mr. Lowe. Sometimes Mrs. Lowe would sort of have to nudge him to tell him that it was his turn to say something, make the motion. But he always, always made the motion. So it happened that morning then that Irie walked the aisle, and stood next to Reverend Gale. Reverend Gale spoke up and said, do I have a mo motion to receive this person into fellowship? And on that particular day, there was silence.
Silence like this kind of silence. Uncomfortable silence. Reverend Gale asked again, still more silence. Mr. Lowe never spoke. It was a terrible moment for me, followed by a very beautiful moment for me. Because though Reverend uh, 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 Mr. Lowe said nothing, then suddenly somebody over on the right said, I make the motion. And then someone on the left said, I make the motion. Then someone up in the balcony said, I, I make the motion. It was like as if finally the whole congregation ended up making the motion. It was like almost as if time itself had gotten ready to change. And the scripture says, <clears throat> Scripture says, all of Nineveh repented and fasted and put on sackcloth and together made the motion. Let me tell you something. When you get out of these laureled halls and go out into this world to serve the Lord, I guarantee you one day you're going to find yourself in Nineveh. It may be a little church way more conservative than you, or it may be a school board whose policies need readdressing, or it may be your own denominational body that you belong to that needs a word from the Lord. But I guarantee you, no matter what it is, one day you'll be sent there. And when you are, let me plead with you to do two things, two things. One, don't demonize Nineveh. Don't write them off as bumpkins or bigots or presume that they just aren't ready to hear God's honest truth yet. And do not, do not delight in their ignorance or their stubbornness. Do not relish in their deafness. And two, go there. Go there and speak your truth. Go and speak it as clearly and as honestly and as hopefully as you possibly can. Go there and preach. I mean really preach. Preach for conversion. Preach for God's sake. For God's sake, preach and give them a chance. For God's sake, give them a chance. And for your own. Look, here's, here's something I want to tell you. And here's why. Because God loves mean, old, bigoted, nasty, Nineveh, Kudzu, Lowe's Grove. Just as much as God loves and cares for any of the rest of us. And that is the gospel truth. And number two. Because no matter what Nineveh says, no matter what they decide, no matter how they respond, the real conversion, the real conversion that may need to take place is your very own. Now, a coda to that story about Mr. Lowe after Irie joined the church that morning, Mr. Lowe surprised us at the door. It was like he was on cloud nine celebrating the day. And all I could make of it was that maybe, well, because he really was about 140 years old and just couldn't hear that he simply missed his cue. And just to prove it, just to prove it, about six months after that, Joe Lowe showed up at our wedding with a gift in hand and a really nice one at that. 
And the term for all of that is called the kingdom of God. And maybe the world is a lot more ready for it than we might think or even wish. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and all of God's people then said, Amen. Amen.